The title of the talk, Health is a Right, True Consciousness, the Core of Christ Healing. You and I are going to discuss health, what it is and what it isn't, health is a right, Christ healing, and Christian science. Not the church denomination, but the teaching. The teaching is about the way the Bible reveals divinity to be, what it is and what it knows. And God's supremacy as absolute truth. Christian science is also a spiritual life practice. It's a life practice that has us try to live increasingly, to the best of our ability, as one with what the Holy Spirit is and the way the Holy Spirit knows things to be, as Jesus did. And this cultivates a spirituality that turns out to heal. Christian scientists ideally, ideally, seek to model Jesus, whom the Bible describes as living not of himself or for himself, but as sent from above, as sent from divinity. Why? His words. So that men should know the truth. Why? To save the world from itself, from its own mistaken material mentality. Please don't confuse Christian science with Scientology. Christian science focuses on Jesus and the Christ healing that Jesus performed and demanded his followers perform also. For two centuries, after Jesus left us, his students and their students performed Christ healing all the time. It was quite common to Jesus, to his students and their students. Health was a right, a right they exercised. But today, what do you think? Most people, I don't believe, hold health to be a right. Far from being a right, most hold it to be conditional health hostage, hostage to chance, genetics, economics, aging, etc. Christian science, taking a diametrically opposite viewpoint, holds that health is indeed an unconditional fundamental right, a right inherent to your true identity and mine as the Bible revealed child of God as his expression of his own being. But health as a right is generally hidden from popular mentality, just as our true identity is also hidden from popular mentality. You know, the Bible says this in 1 John, it says that even now we are the children of God, the sons and daughters of God, but the world consequently doesn't have a clue about us doesn't know who we are at all. Our real need seems to be this, to stop agreeing with the way the world holds us to be, assumes us to be, a mistaken sense of us, and to instead recognize, to claim both our Bible-revealed, God-revealed actual identity as children of the divine and our consequent right to health. Help me out. How does Jesus' famous prayer begin? The full first line. Help me out. Our Father, which art in heaven. Our Father, which art in heaven. Oh, I sometimes wonder if I'm listening. Here's Jesus in Matthew. Call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your Father, which is in heaven. Malachi urges the same divine spiritual fact. Have we not all one Father? Hath not one God created us? Over and over, the Bible urges us to understand divinity is the source of our being, that we don't begin in sperm egg collision. Its very first chapter, the book of Genesis, holds 
that you and I are actually, in real divine terms, the spiritual image and likeness of God, of divinity, of the Holy Spirit. Now, can that be material? Can that be time-bound? No, it doesn't stand, does it? It's not logical. So then, our Bible-revealed spiritual being has to be truer than our seeming. Our seeming isn't our real being. According to scripture, now admittedly, that's a pretty revolutionary position. What do you think? Would the likeness of the divine, the offspring of divine light, the child of the perfect, of the limitless, of the eternal, have a right to well-being, to health? Makes sense, doesn't it? Yes, health turns out to be our right because, 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 because. Divinity itself is the real source of our being. Christian science teaches that Jesus asks you and I to let God be truth, not, not simply in addition to what eyes and ears in the world say, but rather than or instead of what eyes and ears in the world say. The Bible refers to God as truth countless times, over and over, and repeatedly asks you and I to begin to entertain the spiritual and the eternal as our home, as our reality, rather than the material and temporal universe the worldly mind talks about, dwells in. And according to Isaiah, this may actually be our purpose. In Isaiah, the Holy One, divinity, our Father, says this about you and I. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. According to scripture, it seems like you and I are God's evidence of his own being, his witness of himself. This Holy One Jesus described to be spirit, life, life everlasting, truth, truth eternal. And as our Father, as the maker of all that's really ever been made, as the source, the cause, the origin of real being, and as including his creation, coexisting with everything he's ever made, sharing the same being. And Jesus described divinity as all-embracing, all-inclusive, ever-constant, unconditional love. The founder of Christian science, a woman named Mary Baker Eddy came to feel that our real identity and our health, health itself, had to be consistent with this Bible-revealed divinity that Jesus referred to as the source of our being. A bit about Mrs. Eddy. She was raised on the Bible, and she was to me one of the world's most devoted, most committed followers of Christ Jesus' teaching, his life example, his healing ministry, that I believe the world has ever known. She's right there among the top few. A 19th century Renaissance woman, Mary Baker Eddy, founded a worldwide church, a publishing company, a metaphysical college, three international magazines still going strong, an award-winning international newspaper, The Christian Science Monitor. Mrs. Eddy was a publisher, editor, pastor, lecturer, poet, writer of countless articles and numerous books, a best-selling author, which was interesting because every one of her books was intensely metaphysical, spiritual in nature. And she did all this at a time when our country's legal system denied women rights. 
No right to hold property. No right to vote. Not even rights to their own children. In 1906, though Mrs. Eddy was hard at work supporting, developing a worldwide spiritual movement of thought, she had taken herself out of the public view for 20 years by 1906. She had shunned personal adulation, which was becoming a bit of a problem sometime earlier. And so, it's a bit surprising that in that same year, 1906, 20 years after she kind of removed herself generally from society and public view, that the editors of a magazine very popular at the time, Human Life was its name, kind of like People's Magazine today or Us today. Well, the editors of this magazine serialized a biography of Mrs. Eddy, and in introducing it, they defined her this way to the thought of the time. Quote, Mary Baker Eddy is the most famous, interesting, and powerful woman in America, if not the world today. Again, Mary Baker Eddy is the most famous, interesting, and powerful woman in America, if not the world today. Powerful, the most powerful woman in the world? Why? You know, they weren't alone. They were echoing what many in society felt. Why? Well, she wasn't a politician. She wasn't a captain of industry. It seems to me that the editors had to be talking about her influence on the thought, on the society of the time, the impact her life was having, and that was primarily through her writing. Her writings contained revolutionary ideas. Ideas that were making the Bible a common household book, making it a new book to thousands at the time. Unlocking an extraordinary spiritual power that holy work had always contained. Her ideas were all based on a spiritual interpretation of the Bible. And those ideas were healing bodies, regenerating the characters of readers around the world. It seems to me that in calling her the most powerful woman in the world, perhaps, the editors were recognizing the good those ideas were bringing into being. And so, it made her in their eyes perhaps the most powerful woman in the world. These, these editors may have also glimpsed something of her core accomplishments that were kind of unheard of in modern history at that time. Four, I believe, we can point to. First, through a, a revelation that saved her life on her deathbed. Mary Baker Eddy had a glimpse of what she describes as a great fact that life was in and of the Holy Spirit, and that this life in and of the Holy Spirit was the soul reality of existence. Nothing else was true. And through a spiritual interpretation of the scriptures, through the light of that revelation, the laser light that revelation was throwing on the Bible, she discovered a divine spiritual and Christian science that she found, became convinced of, undergirded Jesus' own teaching and healing ministry, his theology. She then consecrated her life to explaining this and sharing it with others. This is the first thing I think the editors may have seen. Second, she lived in the 19th century. It was an age of science, 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 science. It was the buzzword of the time. And Mrs. Eddy herself was a self-trained scientist. And she knew as a product of the age of science, that she had to prove that what she had discovered and was writing to be true. And the only way she could do that was through a ministry of Christian spiritual healing. I'm going to wave a book, expensive, but worth every penny. It's called Mary Baker Eddy, Christian Healer, written by two modern day historians. Now, they don't tell you everything about her healing ministry. They only focus on that healing ministry 
that can be verified by first and second hand accounts. So, some 300 healings verified by first and second hand accounts are in this book, and something of the way she actually went about that healing process as well. Now, these included many cases that doctors had given up. They'd said, well, nothing we can do. Death is almost at hand. We've done everything we can. These included terminal cases of tuberculosis, pneumonia, enteritis, a cancer of the neck so advanced the jugular vein was fully exposed to view. All healed through prayer alone, all quickly. She also healed a seven-year-old boy who'd been born club-footed, who'd never stood or walked in minutes. She raised the dead. Now, Mrs. Eddy was consistently humble in her statements about herself, but I don't have to be. I don't have to be. It seems to me, I believe it's true, if you read this book, you will have to come away with the conclusions that I came away with. That this woman healed on the level of prophets, apostles, and the students of Jesus. I don't believe this kind of spiritual authority, evidenced through consistent Christian spiritual healing, had walked the earth in 1600 years, not since the early Christians, second century. That was two, if you're counting. Three, three. Though not done since the early Christians, Mrs. Eddy personally taught others how to heal in a Christian, scientific manner how to heal effectively through prayer, through spiritual means alone. She taught almost 800 students, the majority of whom went on to have successful careers as spiritual Christian healers. Hadn't been done in 1600 years. Fourth and finally, the Bible-based revolutionary ideas in her writings still today heal hundreds, perhaps thousands, every year. And still teach hundreds, every year, how to help others to spiritual Christian healing. I'm not sure that that isn't somewhat unique in the history of the world. Her primary work is called Science and Health, with key with key to the scriptures. Now, in that book, she explains how you and I can understand, can apply the theology and the spiritual laws basing Jesus' own unparalleled healing ministry to healing today's problems, our problems. Through the love of this dear branch church, you can pick up your own copy of her primary work, Science and Health, at the unparalleled low price of zero. <laughs> so if you don't have it, get it. If you know someone deeply in need, get it for them. If you've got lots of copies, don't. <laughs> the last 100 pages of this book are written by 84 different people who, though Bible familiar, hadn't understood the Bible. There's a difference between familiarity and understanding, isn't there? And as they began to read this, the ideas in this Bible-based book, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, and began to assimilate them, drink them in, stand as one with these revolutionary ideas, they were healed. 84 different people healed of anything, almost everything you can imagine, just by reading the the ideas in this book, Drinking the Men. To me, Mary Baker Eddy became the greatest proponent of your right to health and mine since Jesus and Paul. But she found that she herself and we all need to be educated out of a false sense of our identity and a false sense of what constitutes health. She called it a health illusion before you and I can actually begin to awake to what health really is. 
with an authority born of her unparalleled experience as a modern day Christian healer, she writes this startling, to me, startling redefinition of health. It's in her book, Miscellaneous Writings. It's seven words, so I'm gonna ask you to repeat them after me, because this is a takeaway. <laughs> the true consciousness is the true health. With me, the true consciousness is the true health without me. The true consciousness is the true health. Thank you. True consciousness, what the heck is that? Well, according to Christian science, true consciousness is God's own understanding, the thoughts of God. True consciousness, true consciousness. Thoughts belonging to the divine mentality. Interestingly, Albert Einstein, I never met him, but I love to impersonate him. Albert Einstein <laughs> said this, I want to know the thoughts of God, the rest details. I want to know the thoughts of God. Whoa, what a Jesus-like aim that seems to me to be on Albert's part. Jesus, Jesus, Matthew records him with his very first words, not his first recorded words, but the very first words he utters in his public ministry. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That means here, now. Fill in the place we don't think it is, at hand. But repent, that's the problem word, repent. Doesn't mean, oh, I'm such a miserable sinner, I'm so sorry, I'll try to be better. Doesn't mean that. Jesus used the Greek word, his first word in his public ministry, metanoia. He spoke Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. Metanoia, his first public ministry word. And that does not mean repent. It means think differently. Think differently. His first public voicing of his mission. Think differently. Christian science teaches that Jesus means not, not accepting what eyes and ears and the world and human opinion say is so, no. But instead, instead, to let divinity begin to originate, base thought, lead, reasoning, so that our received mentality becomes more in line with the divine understanding. God's own thoughts, true consciousness, true consciousness. The Bible describes divinity to be the infinite understanding. Doesn't leave a whole lot of room for other understandings to be real, does it? Now, and the kicker is divinity-based thought heals, so maybe we'd be smart to listen to Jesus think differently. Think differently. If Mrs. Eddy's right, that true consciousness, reflecting divinity's own understanding, is the true health, and her own healing ministry, and the countless thousands of doubly verified healings that have gone on over the last 140 years of Christian science practice, seem to support her contention that true consciousness is the true health, well then, real health is not determined by time and material conditions, the popular view. No, real health is found instead in spiritually mental positions, positions originating in divinity's own understanding of itself and the universe it's made one with its own being. Bible described this infinite understanding as perfect, as eternal, as spiritual, as constituting and including everything it's ever made. 
You know, the immense record of Christian spiritual healing in Christian science over the last 140 years can be found by anyone by visiting a Christian Science reading room or going online at christianscience.com. I encourage you to do that. Although I've been in the practice of Christian spiritual healing for over 20 years, boy, I am learning more every day about exercising my right to health, real health. But everything I learn seems to be an expansion of basic lessons I'd experienced growing up as a Christian science Sunday school student. I'll tell you about a few of them. But each healing taught me more about real health as true consciousness. In an early Sunday school class, a friend of mine came five, six minutes late to Sunday school with the symptoms of a terrible cold. And he said, I'm so sorry I'm late. I caught a very bad cold and it made me slow this morning. The teacher, without missing a beat, handed him a tissue and said, you caught a cold, did God throw it to you? No. No, he said, God is good. He would never throw me something bad like a cold. And the teacher then said, well, if God didn't throw it to you, how could you catch it? <laughs> and we started as a class to discuss some divine spiritual facts. Whatever God's child really has, really is, comes from divinity, from the Holy Spirit. Rather like a sunbeam comes from the sun and is the presence of the sun's own nature. The Bible declares that God is, first of all, good, endlessly good, making only good. So what we get from our divine parent sourcing our being has to be good. If it isn't good, divinity couldn't send it. So, so we as God's children then, we couldn't receive it or catch it any more than a sunbeam could receive something not already in the nature of the sun at source. Hmm. So we began to see that catching a disease, yeah, that was, a, that was an error, a mistake. A, a dream, perhaps, calling itself a reality, oh yeah, but nothing that we had to believe and nothing we had to fear. And there were many good reasons not to. Chief among them, accepting these wrong views, well, we realized that would deny God's infinite goodness, deny his love for his children. Now, we didn't want to do that. Within a few minutes, my friend was totally free contributing to Bible lesson discussions without any symptom of what had been apparently a very severe cold. And we all saw how natural, how easy Christ healing could be. All it took was an honest thought shift. And it's one the Holy Bible encourages us to have. Solomon, writing in Ecclesiastes, oh, Proverbs, forgive me, writing in Proverbs, he says this, Lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. Acknowledge the nature of God, the Holy Spirit. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him. Let him direct. It seems to me this lines up with Jesus' think differently. Think differently. And that, I believe, is what we'd unconsciously done. We didn't do the normal human go-along thing. You know, agreeing with physical symptoms, calling them real, supposing health material, and a lapse of health normal, hoping for a return to health sometime down the road. Now, instead, we'd thought differently. We'd acknowledged the fundamental nature of God as good, and that he sourced our being, constituted everything we really were. And we'd let this direct our paths, lead our reasoning into conclusions derived from divinity's own understanding of things, into true consciousness. And as we accepted it, as we stood with it, as we aligned with it, true consciousness 
proved itself to be true health. True consciousness proved itself to be true health. Now, Christian science teaches that a process like this is kind of letting the real displace the unreal, assumed real heretofore. It teaches that it's letting our real being begin to displace our seeming. Repeated experiences like this begin to convince you, oh my gosh, maybe I really am a child of God. Whoa. I've come to believe that divine love itself through Christ healing, our Bible described true father, true mother, through Christ healing begins to demand that we recognize that we are his likeness, his expression of his being the work of his hands. Love, love demands, I think over time, that you and I acquiesce, that we begin to see the imperfect, separate-minded, material personality that you and I seem to be is just not who we really are. Is not the divine realism. The Christ is defined in Christian science as God's messaging. God revealing the truth of his nature and of ours as he knows us to be his spiritual creation. The mission of the Christ, and I think to Mary Baker Eddy, the point of Christ's healing was to begin to introduce us to our real selves as spirit knows us to be, to help us lay claim to who we eternally are. And to turn from the world's lies about us is just never our truth. Never our truth. I grew up in northeastern Ohio, and northeastern Ohio fights happened. I'm sure that's not true in Beverly Hills or L.A. Still a are you awake? Yeah. <laughs> Normally I get a bigger laugh on that. Okay. Oh, sorry. I said I grew up in northeastern Ohio where fights happened. Probably not true in Beverly Hills or L.A. Okay. Well, the problem was in my neighborhood I was at a distinct disadvantage. Everybody knew I was insanely ticklish. If you even made a move towards me, I was already gone, let alone actually tickling me. Now, at one point, three guys ganged up on me tickling first because they knew they had an advantage. Well, it was so bad this time that it actually hurt. It was painful, and the pummeling was also proceeding. Well, desperation, I learned, can prompt prayer. <laughs> Sunday school, Sunday school had taught me that I wasn't who I normally thought of myself as, what the world normally thought I was, that I was God's child and his likeness, and I reasoned that God had been revealed to be truth and the Holy Spirit and, and love and none of that was physical. So God couldn't be tickled. <laughs> and if I was his likeness, I couldn't be ticklish either. And in that moment, I believed that. I accepted it and instantaneously not over time, instantaneously, I was free. I carried that for years. Now, I wish I could tell you I, taught of that, uh, I treated that as a holy moment, but instead I put my hands behind my neck and dared them to tickle me. <laughs> uh, forgive me, Father. But, you know, they tried, but it didn't work. I was free, and this may be small potatoes to you, but after years of suffering, huge, huge to me as a young kid. And perhaps precious early evidence that if the human experience contradicts the divine realism that we can receive when we listen to what God knows things to be like, if we'll let what God knows become truer to us than history, than sensation, than material conceptions about ourselves, it will bring healing. True consciousness will prove itself in our experience to be true health. 
Spiritual healings like this also, I, begin, I believe, begin to alert us to the negative effect that human mentality, human thought, often plays. Anchored as human thought is in a material misconception of ourselves, as time-based, hostage to organic structure, we often suppose, you and I, that we can know things in a way the Holy Father, the Holy Spirit, couldn't know them to be. We suppose that we can know things in a way that's unlike divinity's own understanding. We suppose, we're led to suppose, that we can know more than God. Scary. <laughs> tisk tisk. Human ego. Human ego. Not, not really who you and I are, but boy claiming to be us, and often fooling us into believing that we could be a consciousness besides the infinite understanding, another mind, a mind besides God. But I believe that would be biblically untrue consciousness. Here is God speaking in Isaiah, referring to himself again as the Holy One. God says, there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. The Lord in Hebrew is defined as the, that's Jehovah, or Yahweh, the eternal self-existence. The eternal self-existence. And God is saying there ain't nothing beside him. No other mind, no other consciousness, no other life, soul, or spirit. Hmm. Question. If, as we, you kindly repeated with me, if true consciousness is the true health, is untrue consciousness, believing you and I could know something in a way that divinity doesn't, believing we could know something contrary to the way God knows things to be, is untrue consciousness, believing in things love couldn't make or know, something that we would want to hold on to if true consciousness is the true health? I was half-hearted. No. No. no, yes. I had a guy sitting where Bill is sitting right now, about 11 years of age, about a year and a half ago in this same lecture. And when I asked that question, he went, no! <laughs> so let a little child lead you. Let a little child lead you. Untrue consciousness. <clears throat> Worldly mentality. Bible described by the Apostle Paul as the enemy of spirit. Consequently, our enemy. Untrue consciousness, worldly mentality, often disparages Christ healing and asks questions like, yeah, why not leave healing to medicine? You know, and if Jesus was here today, given the advances of modern medicine, oh man, would he even care about spiritual healing? The answer to that question often asked is emphatically yes. Yes, he would. Jesus demanded, demanded that his students heal others in a spiritual, Christly way and inferred that only by this could they prove they were beginning to understand his teaching and beginning to walk in the way that he modeled as the way of salvation. Today, however, most I believe, think of healing as only body repair and as totally disconnected from either divinity or salvation. And I think it's a sad mistake. Now, don't get me wrong. Christian scientists choosing usually to turn to prayer and rely on Christ healing, Christian scientists are not anti-medicine or anti-doctors. No way. We love and we're taught to love and to respect good wherever it occurs in the human scene, including in the medical profession. Those medical professionals are often dedicating their lives to relieving human suffering, as Mrs. Eddy did herself as a practicing homeopath homeopathist before her discovery of this divine science. 
Mrs. Eddy, though poor for much of her life, dirt poor, became wealthy and she contributed financially, significantly, to fund a local hospital. And she wrote publicly commending the highest class of medical physicians. Mary Baker Eddy was not anti-doctors or anti-material medicine. What she was, was she was pro a divine science, a mental medicine derived of God, true consciousness reflected in our life. And she found that this divinely derived mental medicine was what she believed Jesus practiced and taught as necessary to salvation. That was why it was so important to her. Christian scientists are not dictated to by their church. They are free to choose material medicine if they wish to. Most don't. It's just simply not the route Christian scientists usually take. And there's so many reasons for that, but I'll give you just a few of the chief ones, maybe three. Because for as many as five generations, relying on the Bible revealed nature of God, turning to prayer and Christ healing, has met the needs for five generations of Christian science families. And not just for physical problems, but for all the human problems that can emerge in our human scene here. Two, because Christian scientists understand, as they get into it, that reliance on material methods, believing matter to have power for good or for evil, and reliance on true consciousness derived of the divine understanding, spirit's own understanding, these two reliances negate each other. So mixing them proves counterproductive in their experience, so they don't do that. And three, because Christian scientists are often interested in more than a fix. More than a fix. Ideally, 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 Christian scientists seek an ever larger understanding of the divine, of God, and a larger lived relation to him. And they find that this kind of living prayer meets legitimate human needs because it's an act of worship. That eternal truth about God and man in his likeness is the Christ that the human Jesus embodied so completely, so fully. He let the divine understanding govern, govern his thinking, his living, his motives, displacing worldly viewpoints, worldly motives. And encouragingly, he promised in John that we each finally would come to know the Christly truth that so fully governed him, and it's on the wall. Ye shall know the truth. Ye shall know the truth. Not maybe if you work at it, you might. You shall know the truth. And Jesus also said in the book of John, I've given you an example. Follow me. Follow me. When I was 12, I love biking, biking. Now, that's not Dambi Pamby. It wasn't biking unless it was, you know, boom, fast, fast. So one day I was hurtling down a narrow country road some distance from my home, and a car came around the bend right in the middle of the road, forcing me off to the berm. Now, that had happened a number of times before, and that had been fine, but this time, as I went off onto the berm, my front tire hit a patch of loose gravel, then a rock. I was catapulted head over heels, bike in the ditch, landed on my knees. When I kind of came to, I realized I had no jeans below the knees. They were just like shreds, tatters, hardly there. But more, more sadly and shockingly, I realized that the entirety of one kneecap was entirely missing. 
and the skin normally covering that kneecap was hanging down by a, a silver, uh, slender thread of skin. And there was a lot of blood. Using, I guess, some common sense, I, I reached down and I gingerly put that patch of skin roughly back where it belonged normally, held it there, and then I started to shake. Remember, this was the Dark Ages. This was BCP, before cell phones. <laughs> so I was alone. There was no help to be had until I remembered prayer. Sunday school had taught me I could turn to God, and boy, did I need him. And the things that came to me as I reached out were two things that I'd memorized, generally, in Christian Science Sunday School. They were the 91st Psalm, treasured by almost all Christians, and what is referred to in Mrs. Eddy's writings as the scientific statement of being. I'm going to read the first portion of that 91st Psalm that came to thought, and I went over it and over it. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver me, deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noise and pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust his truth, his truth, his truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. Well, when you're in a tough spot, like I seem to be at that moment, I needed to be encouraged not to fear. I needed to be reassured of God's protecting care. Physical sense was arguing through the human mind that, boy, was I material and God was absent. He was of no help. The spiritual demand and my right, your right, was to let true consciousness begin to offset that false picture that was dispiriting. The 91st Psalm was helping that to happen in my experience. I remembered another comforting verse that many of you know. He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. And I heard that as, you know, God's messaging would be there for me. He could communicate ideas that would come to my need. Truthful messages would be caring for me and I wasn't alone. Now, the scientific statement of being was something I had to go over many times before I began to feel it to be true. It contrasts spirit and matter, and I need you to think freshly about matter here. The wall looks solid, doesn't it? Both walls. But physical science has proven that's not the case. That's an appearance. That wall is not even static. It's wildly in motion. Minuscule atoms separated by great distances from electrons whizzing around them like crazy. That's what's going on there. That's what's going on. It looks solid and static because quantum physicists have become, some of them, not all, but many of them have become, uh, begun to arrive at the conclusion that the basic building block of the material universe is thought. It's the human mind's consent to solidity, to stasis. Okay, so when you hear matter in the scientific statement of being, don't think about external solid stuff. Think, think of it as human consciousness objectifying, mistaken human consciousness, objectifying its own fabricated assumptions of limits, 
of imperfections, of good and evil, and self-deludedly believing that its own dream objects constitute external sol solid reality. Again, again, matter, many believe, is human mind suppositions consented to, almost unconsciously, that it's subjective, the entire material universe, that it's more in us than we in it. I know that's mind-blown, but that's where people are beginning to go. It's not the external solidity matter that it's supposed to be. So now I'm going to read the scientific statement of being. There is no life, truth, intelligence, nor substance in matter. All is infinite mind and its infinite manifestation, for God is all in all. Spirit is immortal truth. Matter is mortal error. Spirit is the real and eternal. Matter is the unreal and temporal. Spirit is God, and man is his image and likeness. Therefore, man is not material. He is spiritual. Boy, I tell you, I had to read that a whole lot of times until it began to ring as if it were by my fact, the truth about me. Sunday school had taught me that man in that passage referred to me, who I really was, that divine image and likeness. I wasn't material. The world was wrong. I was spiritual. Matter is mortal error. The belief, the belief calling itself a material mortal personality, mistaking, buying into material fiction instead of spiritual fact, that wasn't me, isn't any of us really, despite what sensation and bloody pictures said, I began to feel that what was being said about God and me and his image had more truth to it than the picture of wounded, shaken boy with a busted pike. At that point I heard go home. I was interesting, holding the crumpled wheel off the ground with one hand and the skin on my knee with the other. I got home. And while my mother was cleaning the knees, she allowed me to call a Christian science practitioner for prayerful support of my own prayer. Now, a Christian science practitioner is someone doing their best 24-7 to listen to God, to hear how he knows his universe, how he knows himself, and his child to actually be. And does their best to communicate what they're hearing to the person calling them for prayerful support, encouraging them to admit this to be their truth and to begin to live more as one with it. Now, this kind of living prayer is worship that generally brings healing. Well, to the degree that we align with it, stand with it. So the practitioner asked me to consider another passage in Mary Bickerity's primary work, Science and Health, with key to the scriptures. I'm going to read it from my text here. I had never read this passage before. It was new to me. When an accident happens, you think or exclaim, I'm hurt. Your thought is more powerful than your words, more powerful than the accident itself to make the injury real. Now, reverse the process. Declare that you are not hurt and Understand the reason why, and you will find the ensuing good effects to be in exact proportion to your disbelief in physics and your fidelity to divine metaphysics, your confidence in God 
as all, which the scriptures declare him to be. Whoa, this was a shocker. I'd felt God would be with me in trouble before, but here, here it seemed I was being asked to affirm I wasn't hurt. And to see, at least begin to see that God's child, my real identity, couldn't be hurt and wasn't defined by physics or material history because God was all. I was asked, I felt, to begin to entertain the notion, the, the idea, the truth, that I wasn't my own life, separate from divinity, but was the very expression of the life that divinity itself is. You know, it hadn't have been hard for me to accept that God was perfect prior to this, but now this passage seemed to me to be asking me to admit that God's perfection included me, included everything that was real, was all that was real, true. And if this was true, then the accident and its supposed effects on a supposed material personality couldn't have the reality that it seemed to be having, and that I had a right, perhaps a demand, to see both accident and its supposed bad effect, both to be unreal. Unreal. Oh, this was new. I began to see that buying in to accidents, to chance, was inconsistent with the revelation of an ever good God as the creator, the governor, the spirit, and the substance, the mentality of all that was real. This, this too, was new. And I'm still praying, as many in the room are, to accept this more deeply each day. Dwelling in the secret place of the Most High, that began to mean anchoring thought within received true consciousness, what God knows. Abiding under the shadow of the Almighty meant not letting what others think or what the material physical senses were trying to tell me convince me that there could be reality or truth to anything God couldn't know, couldn't be, couldn't manifest. To abide instead, to be at home instead with only what God could know only with what God could express. And in prayer, I promised my practitioner I'd do my best to try to do just that. My practitioner commended that and said she'd continue to pray. Now, I went to school the next morning with a gauze pad taped over my knee under my jeans with a note exempting me from gym. The following morning, about 36 hours after the accident, you could not tell there'd been an accident. You could not tell where the healing had even taken place. Knee perfectly normal. Surrendering human misconceptions of things to the divine, standing with God received understanding as truth, true consciousness, true consciousness had once again proved itself to be true health. Normal medical treatment, though often so caring, so loving, well-meaning, would have likely required a number of hospital visits, many, many stitches, accepting scarring, perhaps, and time and material aids needed for full recovery. But you know, even if that healing had come along through medical practice methodology, it would have missed showing me anything about my divine right to health. Anything of the spiritual truth of God and my relation to him as his son. But it's precisely this true consciousness that I'm learning is the real gift. It's precisely the revelation that actual existence, yours and mine, is spiritual and not material. 
that's the real gift, that's central to salvation. A few years ago, a few years later, sorry, not a few years, many years ago, but a few years later, battling with Osage oranges brought another opportunity to prove that true consciousness is the true health. Who's seen an Osage orange? Turns out not to be orange, it's green, it's softball size, it's knobbly, it's hard as a rock. It's the fruit of the Osage tree, and a buddy of mine had an Osage tree in his front yard, and when it was in fruit, about five of us would gather, <laughs> grab that fruit, and wing it at each other. You know, it had Osage fights. Man, if you got hit with one of those things, it would sting like crazy. And crazily, that seemed to be the whole point of the game, I don't know. <laughs> Well, we were having a spirited fight. I'd gotten some good ones in and, you know, glanced at my watch, whoa, time to go home. Now, everybody in my neighborhood knew my mother. And I told them my mother had told me when I had to leave. Nobody in my neighborhood disappointed my mother. So they knew I had to go. We waved goodbye, I turned. But one of my friends who'd gotten the worst of it in the fight decided to throw one last Osage fruit at me as my back was turned. Others shouted to warn me. I turned around, smack right in the eye, kablam! So hard it knocked me down on the ground. Now you can imagine the tearful walk home and the ugly picture in the mirror presented. Swelling cuts, abrasions, every color under the rainbow and no sight, hardly any, out of the, side, out of the eye. Just faint light. Scary. My mother consented to have me call a Christian science practitioner, for which I'm grateful. Not that my parents were Christian scientists, though my mother had had a deathbed healing and had studied it just a little. But they allowed me to try Christian science, and if they saw improvement, I could continue with it. If not, they held that clinic in reserve. Okay. So she let me call the practitioner. I, I blurted out the story to the practitioner. along with a little venom <laughs> towards my friend who hadn't cared that my back was turned. I felt betrayed. After a pause, the practitioner said something like, isn't he God's child too? And then after another pause, she said something like, would God want you to hate him? Oh, <laughs> man. Those questions rebuked the tempest of self-righteous, justified rage, hatred going on inside me. The practitioner helped me see that human mind, worldly mentality was trying to hypnotize me, trying to hypnotize my friend as well. That Worldly mentality, Paul calls the enemy of spirit, the carnal or fleshly mind, hypnotizing us both to act and feel in a way very unlike a real father, whom the Bible describes as love, as good, hypnotizing him and me to, to live as imperfect minds among other imperfect minds, rather than as the expression of the one divine mind, holy good holy love, hypnotizing us both to believe that evil could be real and could attach itself to persons when God's child had to reflect divinity's own sinless character. Whoa. Well, if I wanted to claim my right to health, as love's child, love's demand was that I begin to resist the hypnotic spell and begin to reflect something of divine love's own true consciousness and true character. The practitioner asked me to pray for that, to pray to let how the Holy Spirit knew both my friend and I to become truer to me than that mistreatment history. to let the divine overcome and outshine the human story. I said I'd try. <laughs> but I meant it. But I meant it. 
because I didn't like the pain. And I did mean it. I did try. And in a few hours, a warm feeling from my friend began to resurface, replacing that self-righteous rage. I found I could probably forgive him because wounded pride, prompting nastiness, was not part of his true character as God's son, nor was anger and hate true of me as God's expression of his own being, the, manif the manifestation of his life and of his love. Now, this was a special kind of forgiving. It wasn't big-hearted human forgiving. This kind of forgiving was allowing the divine understanding of our spiritual identity, true consciousness, to break the hypnotic spell, to cancel the temptation to believe in sinful character and human history as the reality of things. About this time was bedtime. I'm pleased to tell you I woke up the next morning with no evidence there had ever been a problem. Redness, swelling, pain, blurred vision, all gone. Abrasions, bruises, gone. All completely well. And I felt free even after school to play with my friend again without any evidence of hard feeling. Now, this was another early evidence that true consciousness will prove itself to be true health. But more than that, it was an early evidence that true consciousness must always be love-aligned. True consciousness must always be love aligned. That healing resulted not just from a thought shift as others had done, it required something of a heart shift as well. When I care to listen to what that experience can teach me, it continues to help me deal with the hurtful actions of others. With hypnotic temptations to believe, sinful human personalities can fill the space that God's child actually occupies that wrong-motived human beings, looking so real in our experience, can actually displace God's character as infinite, limitless good filling all space. A divine good, the Bible says in Jeremiah, fills heaven and earth. And in Hezekiah, is a pure horizon to behold evil. And in 1 John, is light without a hint of dark without a trace of dark. That experience, as I reflect on it, helps me see that a lack of love in any direction is unhealthy because it can't be true consciousness. Thought originating in the love that God is. And I promise you, if you want to take a quantum leap forward in your realization of true health, oh, on mentally bended D, let love cleanse you of any temptation to justify hardness, coldness, resentment, or hate of someone else, including even that other political party. I kid you not, because to hold unloving views in any direction enshrines mortality, calls evil real, opposes the thoughts of God, and so opposes true health. And understanding this, Jesus told you to love even your worst enemy. To love. Well, I can tell you too of childhood warts that medicine couldn't deal with, headaches, nausea, poison ivy, very severe burns, very severe, and more, all healed through Christian scientific prayer that to some degree let the divine truth about things coming straight from God, true consciousness, overcome in some degree the human beliefs about things that I normally consented to. And of many healings experienced in the same way as an adult and by those in my Christian science healing practice. Often healings that just could not happen 
if material law was really law, and if we really were material ourselves, other-minded ourselves. Some years ago, a friend of mine, handyman, called me on a hands-free device, driving home to his wife, who fortunately was a Christian science nurse, and you'll know why fortunately, because he called me telling me that fixing a furnace, head and torso, well inside, clothed only in a cotton t-shirt, for some unbeknown reason, the furnace had exploded into flame, spontaneous combustion had ignited a ball of flame with great force. The picture was, engulfed by flame, his neck, face, and arms were severely burned. A Christian science nurse is someone who's skilled in practical care, doing the thing that seems wisest under the human circumstance. But as she or he does that, to turn their thought from appearance to what God has to reveal to them of the true spiritual nature of the individual that is their patient, of themselves, of the universe. Well, I told him I'd be praying for him, and when his wife had kind of done her work, he should call me back. So during my prayer time, before he called, I reached out and I began to hear that my friend couldn't be the material personality the world said he was that he had to be God's likeness. And as that, he could only express divinity's spiritual nature and was unable as the likeness of God to witness or to feel or to be impacted by anything not originating in the Holy Spirit, in divine love. And so in his true identity as the child of God, oh man, he was forever pain-free, mistake-free, accident-free, you know, divinity being infinite, it's impossible for divinity to know you and me in a way that's inconsistent with the way it knows itself to be. It's got to be the same. Because in divine science, like sun and sunbeam, God and man coexist as one in being. And Jesus says so in John chapter 17. He prays that we wake to find ourselves one with him in God, made perfect in his Holy One, loved before the foundation of the world, mistaken material mentality. Well, so my friend then, as God's likeness, was eternal, was spiritual, untouched by accident, by mortality itself. When he called, I shared this with him, and we agreed together to ask for God's help in building our conviction in these truths, ask God's help in allowing his own true consciousness to govern the way we saw things, displacing suggestive mortal material pictures, supposing man to be separate from God and unlike him. Well, the following day, great improvement. Pain, inflammation, blistering, redness, gone. Skin almost perfectly normal. In less than 24 hours. With one exception. The story picture was that this was an old furnace, a lot of soot caked on the walls, big forceful explosion had seemingly impelled particles of soot to positions deeply embedded under the exposed surfaces of his skin, arms, neck, face. So his body was discolored, and he was concerned about that. And we were led to wonder if we could actually go to the hardware store, buy some blue or brown paint, and actually discolor a sunbeam. You know, get it to look blue or brown, and we laughed at that. And then we realized that soot matter was simply a belief in the human mistaken mentality, and it could no more be embedded in God's spiritual likeness in man as the son of God, then dark paint could ever get to attach to a sunbeam. There could be no substance, no consequence from anything without divine origin, not coming from the Holy Spirit. We agreed to pray again for God's help in anchoring our thought in these spiritual facts. And the following morning, 
There was no evidence remaining. He was a bit disappointed. He couldn't even find soot on the pillow. <laughs> Again, surrendering the human sense of things to the divine. True consciousness, true consciousness proved itself to be true health. Christ healing like this points us to who we really are, points us to the fact that we may not be what we appear to be. It begins to wake us to the fact that our temporal seeming is not our eternal being. Christ healing reveals more of God's real nature and of our oneness with it. And maybe, just maybe, this is why Jesus demanded Christ healing. Because it's the way of salvation. Experience enough Christ healing, you just might be convinced existence is spiritual. Not material. And I may take that. Christian science practice is not primarily about fixing the bad stuff. Though that certainly happens regarding body, relations, finances, etc. Christian science practice is really about exchanging the human mindedness causing the bad stuff, maintaining it for true consciousness, the thoughts of God. It's about claiming oneness with divinity as our true status and about living that more. This kind of prayer is actually worship, surrendering the human to the divine. And that's why it heals and saves. There is a worldly resistance to the thought that Christian science heals, but it ignores mountains of well-authenticated evidence that it does heal. The mistaken notion that Christian science can't heal is to me based on the egotistical argument that true consciousness is human rather than divine. That mortal beliefs about things outweigh the way God knows things to be. Or else, it's based on the assumption that God must know as real what people believe to be so. Admitting evil, sin, disease, and death to be part of the divine creation. Wildly, wildly inconsistent with the Bible's revelation of God as holy good, as love, incapable of knowing evil or engendering the capacity to sin. It's only normal to pray to try to fix bad stuff, but often our prayer asks God, to change bad conditions that we assume to be real. Question, question. If all the bad stuff the world says is so were real, wouldn't God be a jerk? <laughs> I gotta laugh, but it's important. You need to think about it. Effective prayer doesn't change bad conditions. Effective prayer changes you and me, changes us, what we believe to be true and not true. It humbles prideful human knowledge, what we believe. It humbles willful human ego. And changing us, it heals. Prayer that heals lets God take over on the inside, lets spirit govern the way we feel. Let's divine mind govern how we see things, know things to be. Increasingly from his spiritual, perfect, eternal point of view, true consciousness. When prayer lets the Holy Spirit impel change in God-like directions on our inside, it turns out to fix the outside. And repeated evidences of this prove to us that problems, problems were never as external to our feelings or our thought of things as they seemed, as we believed them to be. It is what 
you and I accept as true on the inside that makes the difference in our lives, for better or for worse. Sadly, you and I don't always let the divine overcome the human, overcome our opinions, passions, condemnations, and sadly, you and I seem to suffer until we're ready, ready to let God take over in our thought and in our heart, letting the spiritual trump the material, letting the eternal outshine the temporal, letting love fill loveless spaces is the soul of effective prayer. It is the surrender of the human to the divine. And because it's worship, it heals. True consciousness is never really absent. When you're suffering and you think you can't hear God, man, I've been there. We're simply being tempted to feel, believe that we have our, our own separate mind and life apart from divinity. Bible revealed to be the infinite and only mind in life. Now a ray of sunshine doesn't have its own life. We're clear about that. It's the life of the sun individually manifest, right? Right. right. Okay. Thankfully, through the tender mercies of the Christ, you and I are led to understand, to discover that we are not our own life. We are the manifestation of God's life, his shine, belonging not to ourselves but to him, to spirit, to the life and mind that divinity alone is. First Chronicles, First Kings, tell us that everything in heaven and earth belong to God. Isaiah says we're not our own. We belong to the Holy Spirit. We're his. God says we're my, you, you are mine. Divine love, in its love for us, demands, demands that we eventually claim our divine rights. Our right to know God as he is, and our right to begin to understand ourselves as the Holy Spirit knows us to be. Our right to let the divine outshine and displace darkened human misconceptions. To let divinity lift and love the human out of itself, out of its mistaken mentality. Our right to come home, to come home to the secret place of the Most High, love's true consciousness. And love works with us to this inevitable scientific end. Mrs. Eddy in Science and Health and Miscellaneous Writings. The divine must overcome the human at every point. It is the purpose of divine love to resurrect the understanding, the kingdom of God, the reign of harmony already within us already within us, where Jesus said it was, where you and I can find it, and what love, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent love purposes, I think it can count on love fulfilling it. Love won't be denied. Don't take my word for it. Take the word of divine love. In my poor paraphrase, love says this about you and me throughout the Bible. You, you belong to me. You're mine. You are my witness of my own being, my likeness, my son, my daughter. You are one with my life made perfect in me. You've never left me. 
And so, my child, you do know and you do feel my eternal embrace and reflect my own love. You know that health is undeniably your right because I, I am undeniably the source and the substance of your being, the only true consciousness. I'd pray that you don't argue with love. You wouldn't worry about a sunbeam's right to light. Don't doubt your right to health. You are divinely revealed to be God's child. Love's word in the Bible. Prophets and apostles, Jesus, and the well-proven science of the Christ all teach that love, divine love, is the source and the substance of your being of all being. You have love's word on it and the health that goes with it. And I think you already know that you can take love's word, true consciousness, to the bank. Thank you.